man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all mankind. Your hosts here in London, Matthew Russell and Jamie Franklin. Do it. Do the do the oh yeah baby Andre Guide Andre 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 Guide considered one of the greatest French authors of his day. Good afternoon, Matthew. How are you? Good afternoon, Jamie. I'm very very well. Do you know what I'm watching right now? Something about mining asteroids in space. No, no, no. I'm I'm watching the live broadcast. Of the very last Delta Four single stick booster. Holy moly! Yeah. Are you enjoying yourself? Oh no, it's 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 on pause. No. Talk about a cliffhanger. That is a big anti. It is a big anti. I thought I was going to say, yeah, it's taking off now. Well, I'm going to keep a little eye on that. Oh no, no, it's going. <laughs> off it goes. Oh my god! It goes. There we go. Jamie, that's it. I'll tell you what, Matt, you should write films because the way you brought us down and then back yeah, up at I know. the end. Oh, it, it looks like it's bending right over. That's what she said. I thought that was going to blow up then. That's no, looking good. It's looking nominal. That's also what she said. <laughs> All right, it's enough of that. i tell you what we should talk about, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Sarah Francis Whiting. Sarah Francis Whiting, indeed. August the 23rd, 1847 to September the 12th, 1927. She was an American physicist and astronomer, and what a person. Absolutely amazing. So, yeah, she was appointed to Wellesley College as the first professor of physics in 1876. That's a long time that ago. Is a long time ago. 1880, she started teaching a course on practical astronomy at Weasley. And then she'd go and visit MIT because she wanted to pick up the latest info on spectroscopy and and the newly discovered X-rays. And she also helped uh, college trustee another Sarah Witt. Is it another Sarah Whitting? This says Whitting, just without the G. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, helped her to establish uh, the Whitting Observatory. Yes. Of which Whitting became the first director. So that's very confusing, is it? A Sarah Whitin and a Sarah Whitting or really Whiting. Is. Yeah, that that's really quite bizarre. Um let's call the whole thing off. So she had some amazing students of astronomy and, and inspired a generation of Matt, can you give me an example of some stuff that she's done? Uh she did the use of graphs in teaching astronomy or use of drawings in orthographic projection and globes in teaching astronomy. I did that. Did you? Uh, she probably did it first. So, uh, yeah. Jamie, just a bit of quick news before we uh, rattle on to the final it part has. of our Space Habitat series. Although it won't be the last time we talk about Space Habitats, I'm sure. It definitely won't be. But I hope you've enjoyed this uh, series of ramblings. Yeah, August Habitation Month. It's great. Been a great month. Yeah, 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 yeah. And talking of, um, you know, manned space flight, there's been old Nick Haig and Drew Morgan who've been out... Side the ISS, labouring for six hours and 32 minutes, installing the new international docking adapter, IDA3, on the Harmony module. Nick Drew, docking adapter. No, that doesn't work. I was trying to do one of your clever name things, Matt. Oh, what? Nick Haig Drew Morgan. <laughs> 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 yeah, so yeah. Do, yeah. Drew, yeah. Drew's quite a good name for that for that particular it is, game, it's, isn't it? It's perfect, yeah. We'll, yeah. Work, we'll work one we'll out work one by out. next yeah, week. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, something that you'll be super chuffed to hear, Jamie, is that uh, NASA have passed another key review stage for the Europa Clipper. I nearly wet my pants when I read it a couple of days ago. It's getting real now. Yeah. And this is the thing. You can talk about these things as much as you want, but it's actually happening. Get in. Yeah. 2023. Bring it on. I don't really know how it's going to launch yet. Hopefully on SLS, but who oh, knows? That's for the boffins to decide. Who cares? Who knows? Jamie, I want to tell you a little story. Oh, finally. I'm sitting comfortably. I've got my popcorn. It's the tale of the bamboo cutter. Okay. So, yeah, this is one of the very first descriptions of a lunar capital. 
because we're going to be talking about moon and Mars settlements this week. So, yes, ah. a mysterious girl called Kaguya <gasps> discovered as a baby inside the stalk of a glowing bamboo by a childless bamboo cutter called Tekitori no Okina. <gasps> and he raised her with his wife and she became a beautiful princess. She had many oh. suitors, but none could fulfil her impossible tasks until eventually the emperor himself came and fell in love with her. She stayed in touch with him, but revealed that she must return to the moon where she had been spared a celestial war. And then flying saucers, and bear in mind this is a poem from the 10th century, flying saucers were sent to collect her, and with a blinding light they took her away. <gasps> she left the emperor a message and the elixir of life, but he did Ooh. not wish to live forever without her, so he gave his soldiers the task of burning both at the nearest mountain to heaven. And the mountain became known as Fuji, from the Japanese Fushi, meaning immortality. And the smoke can still be seen rising towards his love in the moon. Oh, that's a beautiful story. It is a beautiful story. It's not, it's, it, you know, it's considered one of the very first science fiction stories. And because it contains aliens and spacecraft and all that kind of malarkey. But there's also yeah. another book called The Vera Historia, which by a second century satirist known as Lucian of Samosata. Oh. And he wrote the first detailed account of a trip to the moon in that book. Oh, wow. Yeah, so okay. so yeah, your Romans were up to it way back in the second century. So, yeah, it's beautiful stories out there. But uh, shall we talk about actual moon habitats? Well, just before we do, mm -hmm. if anyone hasn't been to the uh, manga exhibition mm -hmm. uh, in London at the British Museum, it is absolutely incredible. I don't know if it's still on. I think it might be for a few weeks. Go and see it. It's incredible. And there's bound to be some moon-related objects at the British Museum Oh, as there well. is. Yeah, 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 big time. It's obviously building a human habitation on a planetary body other than Earth is something that's always captured our imaginations like nothing else. Really, really has, hasn't so, it? This is why we made it a series. And Matt, all mm. of the images that uh, we've been putting up on our Instagram account, mm -hmm. shout out to Instagram, People have been really enjoying these. Oh, yeah, 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 big time. Including, mm -hmm. we don't want to brag, the one and only Michael Collins. Yeah, who we decided Didn't was we? the greatest astronaut ever. So that's pretty yeah. cool, isn't it? That was pretty cool. I mean, we don't want to show off, but that's the kind of fans we've got. Yeah, well, he started liking quite a lot of them. It's not just the one either. We did send him a message, uh, listeners, to say, could we interview you? Uh, more on that if he ever replies. We hope he does. We're confident. <laughs> We're confident. Uh, Jamie, talking yes. of very cool people, there was a guy called John Wilkins who was a bishop back in oh. 1638, and he wrote a book called A Discourse Concerning a New World and Another Planet, and he predicted a human colony on the moon. Wow. And, of course, I have a book written in 1954 by Arthur C. Clarke and R.A. Smith, which is the seminal, the exploration of the moon. And I, and I keep forgetting, when I open it up, it's hilarious because it's from the library of Hamilton Air Force Base in California via, e oh. via eBay. So it's quite, it's quite a cool book. And they've had that since, like, 1958 in their library. So, I wonder whether someone actually pinched it or whether it was just sold after the library dispersed. I should imagine that at some point they decided that that book... Because that's hell of a fee and someone's passed that fee on to you. Yeah, I think someone... Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful book and it's in really good condition, the, the, the one that I've got. But it's it talks about spaceships. It talks about um, inflatable modules covered in lunar dust for insulation, how the spaceships yeah. are going to get there, reusable spaceships with reusable boosters and in-space manufacturing. And it talks about igloo modules, a nuclear reactor for the power algae-based air purifiers. It's got 
literally Blimey. everything in it, including electromagnetic cannons, so the O'Neill cannons, to uh, fire out cargo and fuel to interplanetary vessels as well. Which, ironically, is the one thing that I keep asking Matt to get me for my birthday, and he never does. Is what? When are you going to get me an electromagnetic cannon? I'm going to literally build you one for your next birthday. Yeah, you keep saying, oh, yeah, I can build that. No, Jamie, like, oh. Jamie, I'm going to talk about our birthday presents later on. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. it's going to be... I'm actually quite excited about it. Oh, my God. Okay. What are the things that are going to enable this to happen possibly in the next decade? Lunar water, Matt, mm-hmm. first up. Lunar water at the lunar poles, discovered definitively by Shandoyan Wan in 2009 but to what level is the moon wet or dry matthew we need to go back there as this is not complete consensus about you know how much water and how easy it is for us to get i know well we definitely need to go back and so research missions research well, landers to go back to prospect it, for water exactly at that. it's not just good enough for us to say there's loads of frozen water on the moon okay well how are we going to get to it how are we going to unfreeze it? What does that machinery look like? How quickly can we do it? How much is there? Can it be sustained? Are we going to filter our own we? Of course, Ch- Chandrayaan yeah. 2, we talked about it last week, has successfully got into lunar orbit and is now dec- uh, circularising its orbit to get closer and closer to the moon it is. to make its landing in September. That's going to be, that's going to be super exciting. Yeah. Not long now. And now, what's the? Do you know what the other advantage of being at the lunar poles are? Because it would also avoid the uh, the problem of two week long lunar nights with continuous sunlight there for solar power. What do you think about that? Well, Constant I, power. Well, it is a game changer. So that, yeah, those... Elon's Elon's got to love that. Yeah. Well, the thing about Elon is he hasn't been that fussed about the moon. Nah, he's not bothered about the moon. He's not he? that fussed about the moon, but. I'm- Although you know what he's like, about a week before we we go there, he'll probably be like, right, I'm going there, and we're doing this, and it's crazy, and we're going to make it work. Obviously, America have been talking about going to the moon for yeah. some time now and colonising it. So it's the NASA Lunar Outpost, which is, as far as I can make out, is still what the main goal of Artemis, the current you know, race to the moon that eventually by 2028 will start having a permanently manned lunar outpost. Now that's, mm. that started during the Apollo era under a project called Lunex, presumably lunar exploration, which started yes. in 1958. And that was to construct an underground air force base. And uh, yeah. And alongside that, was an army project that started a year later called Project Horizon that was to test the feasibility of a military base on the moon using Saturn V rockets. And that was projected to cost about $6 billion, which doesn't sound that expensive, but I suppose in... I don't know whether that's in that... Presumably that was back then, which yeah. would have been ludicrously expensive. And that's 12 soldiers... Uh, to be posted on the moon by December 1966. But, of course, the Nazis had beaten them there by several decades, if you've seen the film Iron Sky. Iron Sky. Have you seen that? <laughs> that's, so, that's so metal, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's, it's really Literally. good. It's basically about how the, how the Nazis got to the moon. It's, of course, not true, but it's a good, no. it's a fun film, nevertheless. It's It's definitely fun. So, yeah, the plan was... 40 Saturn V launches, uh, just 40 Saturn launches, actually, by, by 1964. Mm. Uh, and then by 1965, you'd have cargo deliveries to the moon. 1965, the first man landing by two men to help build and construct all this stuff that's been de- delivered. And then by November 1966, a permanently manned army base of 12 men. Uh <laughs> Exactly that. I mean, pfft. so that's six. This program, Matt, <laughs> would have required a total of 61 Saturn A1 and 88 Saturn A2 launches up to November 1966. And during this period, of course, the rockets would transport some 220 tons of useful cargo to the moon. What do you think would have been useful cargo? Um, guns 
Just like onion uh, onion rings and onion stuff like that. Onion rings, bricks, cement. What do you think about onion rings with like a burger mat? Do you ever get those as a side? I'm not a massive fan of the onion ring. They're often a little bit bit too greasy. Yeah, if they're if they're not that greasy, they're they're good. Hmm. Big fan. Yeah, yeah. No, when they're yeah when they're crispy, I I, I agree that they are good. Um, Sorry to go off topic. Uh, what happened after that? Well, so yes, ni- 1966 through 1967, it would have been another 64 Saturn V launches uh, to make this place operational. So to be honest, that was knocked on the head when NASA kind of took over and, and it was no longer a military sort of thing. So yeah, that I'm went away. I'm glad that it's not a military base on any kind of moon or planet <laughs> other than ours. Well, I don't think we need any more. Yeah, but a lot of space exploration, Jamie, is is obviously you know bolstered by the military. We you know that, that's yeah, the, you I know. know. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have had well, in fact, you know the fact. I that- just don't <laughs> want people with guns pointing them at a country that they're fighting with from the moon. That's all I don't want, Matt. No, but I suppose if you are America and you were worried about freedom, and you and you genuinely thought that that. If the Russians or or the Nazis had got to the moon and took over, that we'd be in trouble. Then I I just don't know. Who knows? I don't. You know. Yeah. Who knows, Jamie? It's not my favourite thing either. I, 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 I no. I'm with you. But the current plan, anyway, is boots on the moon by 2024, and Tick. a settlement by 2028. Now, if that does happen, that it's going to be absolutely amazing, isn't it? I mean, when you said it then, just then, settlement by 2028. That is massive, isn't it? It's that we would have people permanently living on a foreign body orbiting Earth. I mean, holy moly. Yeah, I mean, it'd be absolutely amazing. Now, a lot of this work was done uh, during the George W. Bush's time, uh, a study called the Exploration Systems Architect Study, which uh, often is known as the Vision for Space Exploration. So that mm. gave us, via a very long and tedious kind of road and journey, the SLS and Orion. And in 2006, Shackleton Crater, named after the uh, great British explorer Shackleton. Yes. And if you've ever, if you ever read a book, read that books about Shackleton because they are. I haven't. Oh, I will do. So good. If you want to hear about a man that can manage a situation when all is lost. Then it's the greatest. It's the greatest story of human endeavor, exploration, and management. It's amazing. But anyway, wow, Shackleton Crater, even greater than when I had to take a Fender Blue Zamp, carry it by hand from Fulham to Angel <laughs> via the tubes. <laughs> it, 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 it is more than that. It's it's even more ridiculous than that. Okay, it, wow. <laughs> it's more like Fitzcarraldo. It's, it's like Fitzgerald. I love that film. <laughs> it's more like Fitzgerald times ten. That's what it's like. God. Damn. Yeah. So Shackleton Crater is is sunlit about eighty percent of the time, and it, okay. it's adjacent to a permanently dark region, which means that there's ice and other volatiles are highly likely to be there that you can extract and use quite easily. And yes. the whole shack this area is about the size of the Washington Mall. Whoa. So, you know, not massive, but it's certainly big enough to have a sort of moon settlement that's of a pretty reasonable size. That is pretty big. So since then, the Lunar Gateway obviously has become an essential part of the way that people are looking at that whole system. But as far as I can tell, there isn't really any kind of real solid-looking architectural plans, um, apart from the ones that I'm going to mention for for Mars, I suppose can be kind of we can look at them back on the moon, but it's really yes. funny. It, the Arthur C. Clarke exploration of the moon seems as fleshed out as pretty much the current plan is. So it, I I genuinely yeah, right. feel as though it hasn't really moved on uh, particularly. And and we're talking about we're supposed to have this ready by twenty twenty eight. So there's going to have to be a lot of movement and a lot of kind of. <laughs> stuff going on before now in 2028 for this to actually become true there really is i'm i'm worried that that they haven't got enough time yeah i uh, and and really even we maybe they're going to put, put, pull a bit of overnight 
shifts. And I thought, well, maybe Europe are going to come to the rescue here. Because I've, you know... We've, Again. We've talked about the moon village idea quite a bit and yeah and it's and it's some it's an idea that keeps getting banded around oh the europeans and their moon village but the moon village actually isn't like anything technical or or even you know there's no there's no plans drawn or anything it's it's more of a mm. concept and not only that even though uh, jan werner the ESA director general announced it it's not it's not even an ESA project it's actually run by the moon village association I wish I was a member of that. Well, you can join. No, you can join the Moon Village Association. Can you? Yeah, 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 yeah. It sounds a bit like uh, the church hall running a harvest festival, doesn't it? The Moon Village Association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. it's, it, it's a bit. It's a bit parochial. Is that the right word? I don't know. It's a great word. Yeah. So it's it's more of an understanding, not a single facility. Let's do it together. So it's it's a kind of principle. So it's a bunch of nine principles, basically things like reduce the cost and risk of transport to and from Earth and Moon, support the economic development of the lunar community, those kind of things. So it's it's just a set of principles rather than a fully fledged out plan. Yes, and there's there's other kind it's... of European groups that are related to that, or international groups, in fact, like the International Lunar Exploration Working Group. Or illog, <laughs> it just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Uh, and then there's things like the Moon Base Alliance, which was founded by Dutch entrepreneur Henk Rogers. What a name! And it's based in Hawaii. I mean, how much of a laugh is that joke? A job, the Moon Base Alliance, run by a Dutch dude in Hawaii. Well, it's not the only person who's part of that group, Matt. Mm. Do you want to? Do you want to hear who else is? Yeah, go on then. Not only is there Buzz Aldrin, yeah, yeah, but Matt, the great Yes album artist Roger Dean. That is just so superb. In fact, I noticed. I that, mean, I noticed what a crew. That their logo does look very much like the Yes logo. It has to be. Said. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who got the yeah. I wonder who got the say in that meeting. Roger's like, well, Roger, um, what do you I've think? got a few ideas. <laughs> uh, sorry, Roger. It looks a little bit like the Yes logo from all your albums. <laughs> Actually, it looks more like the Asia logo. But hey, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. And then there's the, there's another society called the Lunar Explorer Society, which is confusingly called Lunix, and they have an equally oh, confusing, confusing project called Artemis. It's like, come on, guys, try and think of other names. Come on. Now, if you talk about the European stuff the uh, of moon visiting, I've noticed a, a name, Bernard Foing. His name Foing. comes up. Foing. He works at STEC, and he was the principal uh, scientist for SMART, which was the first Europe European mission to the moon. Uh and so, yeah, he's a prolific scientific author of 400 articles and stuff. So, yeah, he seems to be the kind of main player in European moon sort of studies. But, wow. yeah, Russia, they've been planning on going to the moon for absolutely ages, and they reckon they'll have a human colony on the moon by 2030, so only a couple yeah. of years later than America. And... Um, and so that's going to have 12 people, and that's using the Federation spacecraft and their Yenisei super heavy rocket. And, of course, Beautiful. the Chinese are up to it as well. Well, of course they are. I still think they'll get there first. You think China is going to get there first? You think they're going to have a colony there first? I'm throwing it out there that they're going to have a colony before Russia. How do you like that? Um, yeah, I quite like it. I quite like it. Well, no, yeah. there's quite a few reasons why you want to get to the moon because – People say, ah, you know, uh, why do you want to go to the to the moon? And, and one of the one of the sort of big pluses is it's great for telescopes. Mm. So if we want to sort of expand our telescopes, there, there's things like there's no atmosphere. It's low gravity, so you can build much bigger. It's really cold, so you can keep your electronics yeah. less noisy. Uh, the regolith itself can be made into mirrors. NASA have um, designed a way of making the regolith into mirrors. And, of course, you can be... Not much light pollution, apart from the sun. Yeah. Well, in fact, there's none if you go if you go to the far side of the moon where you're shielded from not only from the light from Earth but the radio signals from Earth. So, you know... Boom. Yeah. And, uh, and great for looking at the moon because you're there. 
<laughs> it's really good. If you want to get close-ups of the moon, yeah. You'd be like, you oh, don't God, even, I can see the craters and everything. You don't even need a telescope. Maybe, no. No, just a decent pair of binoculars and you can, you can see quite a bit. Um, it's, exactly that. You know, and, and we've been talking about O'Neill cylinders and things like that. Well, of course, it's easy to launch from the moon. In, so you've got your mass drivers, on, and which I'm building for your birthday. Don't worry. Oh, yes. Now, this is, this is one of the key things. Is the amount of gravity on the moon enough to maintain human health? Mm. Like birds, Jamie, what are birds? We just don't know. Very profound of you, Matt. What are birds? We, we just, we don't, just know. don't know. So, of course, most of the moon has got, has got that annoying lunar two-week night, which is pretty annoying. But we've talked about Shackleton Crater, where you can just mm. have 24-hour sunshine. Uh, and here's the, here's the big problem with the moon. There's not many volatiles. So we're talking about nitrogen, hydrogen, and, car- and even carbon. Pretty scarce. So, Could it be possible to mine these? Uh, well, yes. But it's but it's it's really expensive to mine in an area where you don't really have much of the stuff. You know, you don't even do it on Earth, let alone out in space. So one yeah. of the one of the plans would be to build the spaceships that actually arrive at your at the at the moon, make them rich in volatiles themselves, so that you could use the spacecraft as ah, the raw material. So all the things genius. like the heat heat shields and stuff like that, you are made of volatile materials like carbon and and stuff and the interplanetary transport network which we've mentioned before which is a kind of elaborate array of lagrange type points god get an original name (laughs) yeah the interplanetary transport network you could actually use to shepherd massive water trojans from jupiter uh you could sort of shepherd them down the passages of the interplanetary transport network to the moon to be used (sighs) as fuel Genius. And do you know what else? There's no atmosphere like a Franklin party. Uh, Matt, when are you going to grow up? <laughs> um, Everyone knows my yeah. parties, It's they're just legendary. In fact, they're a bit like the moon. They're a radiation nightmare. What about moon dust, Matt? Is that any good for us? Could we, <laughs> if we breathed in some moon dust? No, it's just, it is grim. Oh. It's like tiny, very tiny, sharp and probably highly ionized dust that just gets <laughs> everywhere. Well, yeah, and it made all the astronauts basically pretty ill. It's yeah, not, that's it's not re- good. It's not really good for you. And, of course, farming. Do you know what's weird is that when you said that, <coughs> I took my drink down the wrong way <laughs> and now it's made me pretty ill. <coughs> I thought you were just doing oh, I'm it. I'm just in- simulating what it would be like if I breathed in moon dust. It's it sounds like you've that you've literally been on the moon. I think I, I told you this. I think that in my lifetime I will I will go into space, but maybe I'll go to the moon as well. Yeah. Well Because by that time they'll probably need, you know, some waiters, maybe a cleaner or two. I'll go for that job. Okay. Do you know what the highest temperature is on the moon? During the day. Yes, I do know this because I memorised it. 123 C. Average is 107 degrees C. All right, let me throw it back at you. What about night time? It gets down to minus 153 degrees centigrade. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, your penis at the best of times is small. But imagine that. That's not going in, Jamie. Pardon the expression. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> that, that is literally. I mean, everything about that reply. That has you have to keep that in. Oh, I'm gonna have oh to dear. <clears throat> oh dear. Um. <laughs> oh, Matt. Something here's something close to my heart. Mm-hmm. Now you know. Uh, a few years ago, I was swanning around Iceland as I do, and I went to inside a giant lava cave. Mm-hmm. Now. Lunar lava tubes, mm-hmm. reliable structure, having withstood the test of time, obviously, for billions of years, at temperatures about minus 23. Not bad. Well, that's totally livable, then, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what's the Arctic? Well, much lower than that. Bir- Birmingham's got down to minus 32 <laughs> once. <so. laughs> Forget the Arctic. Birmingham. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, so there, there, there's been some building materials. So, uh, look, things. Have you ever heard of lunacrete? This is the idea proposed by Larry Larry Bayer, was it? Bayer. 
Bayer, Bayer, Bayer. We'll go with Bayer uh, of the University of Pittsburgh uh, in in 1985. A hypothetical aggregate building material similar to concrete formed from lunar regolith that would reduce the construction costs of uh, of building on the moon. What do you think about that? You, there's no point taking building materials to the moon. You might as well make them on on the moon. Now, one one company has done unbelievably well in this in this arena and that's the london-based foster and partners of the great norman foster ah the 3d printer technology company yeah 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 well they well they part they yeah they partnered up with uh, a 3d printing technology company right to make to make this um to make basically with isa they managed to make uh, a one and a half ton block of regolith based moon moon material so they were able to literally demonstrate these kind of bricks made from regolith and 3d printed and uh it's annoying actually because when we were in Estec, we didn't see it because i think it was on display somewhere else but uh, i think it's sometimes on display at Estec. this big um 3d printed block so that's like so that's kind of proven technology now and we'll, and we'll, yeah, we'll mention Norman Foster and his pals uh, later on when we get to Mars because... Um, I would like want... to get one of their reps on the podcast, actually, because I've got so many questions. That's genius. Oh, yeah, no, totally. So energy, Jamie, we got uh, obviously nuclear fission is already kind of totally feasible. I uh, posted on Instagram today of uh, uh, one called um, Krusty. Krusty the Clown. Krusty, yeah. So they named their nuclear re- uh, reactors after Simpsons characters <laughs> for some oh, bizarre really? reason. Yeah, and Krusty is is a working nuclear fission reactor that that um, is going to scale up to be a ten kilowatt wow. um, uh, power supply. So that's that's pretty impressive, and um, it's really safe. Apparently, it's all been working really well. So that's definitely one to watch. And uh, so I think that sort of thing is definitely going to start coming a thing in the next decade of all the legislation about flying nuclear reactors. So what about solar? I mean, you know, combined with fuel fuel cells, obviously this would be easy to do. uh, And you could have RTGs as backups as well, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. So solar on the on the moon, I think, is really really good. Particularly no if you is a no brain. Particularly if you can make the panels themselves from uh, regolith. Yeah. To actually have a settlement there, there has to be some moon based economics. So, what do you think roughly we could have? Oh, well, supplier of raw materials, right? Mm-hmm. For space based manufacturing and obviously solar satellites. So, yeah, so that's all the things that we've been talking about before, isn't it? All these massive O'Neill cylinders. If we're going to start doing stuff like that, then, yes, the moon would be a really good place to start. Yeah, yeah. Exporting helium-3 back to Earth. uh, I mean, that's huge, isn't it? Well, do you know know how much helium-3 they reckon there is on the moon? Go on. In terms of how much energy it would give the Earth and how long it would last. Okay, yeah, how long? 10,000 years worth of free energy wow. using nuclear fusion using the helium-3 from the moon. You say free, but I reckon that Trump's going to cu- come out and say that the moon is his. He bought it in the 80s and that we owe him money for that energy. Big time. We're just predicting it. But mm. wow, 10,000 years, that's genius. <laughs> I thought it was uh, the moon belonged to Garriott because he's he's the only person that owns a piece of public ha- uh, privately held hardware on the lunar ah, surface. Yes, yes, you're so right. So he, he has a legitimate claim. Well, what about this one, finally, Matt? What about mm. propellant from lunar water? Yeah, well, that's your favorite, lunar isn't fuel it? depot. Get in yeah. the 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 moon gas station. Yeah, it's that's that could be a big one, but it's it's how. It's all about how easy that that water is to extract on the moon. Is there yes. tons of it there, or is it just really hard to get at in crystals and stuff? And I ain't going to be much use to man or beast. True that. True that. I so, tell you what, Matt, I'm bored of the moon. Should we talk about Mars? Let's talk about Mars because there's two projects I really want to talk about. Like really want to talk about because they're really exciting. Go on. I'm just like totally excited about it. Yes, NASA 
and Bradley University as well are involved. They have been running one of the centennial challenges that NASA do called the 3D Printed Habitat Challenge. And uh, it's sponsored by Caterpillar and people like that. Um, it's an amazing uh, project. And it's been running for quite some time now, since 2015, with a total of $3.15 million up for grabs. Okay. Now, I'm interested. Phase one, which was just delivering architectural renderings, yeah, uh, was won by... Ice House. Now, I really want to talk about Ice House because the Mars Ice House, I think, is really, really exciting uh, project. So that would be located in Albamons in the Northern Hemisphere where there should be an abundance of water covered by 30 centimetres of loose regolith. Ooh. So this is – bear in mind, we're back to – we're on Mars now. We're on Mars. So. Yeah. It's really clever. So normally habitats that we've been talking about on Mars, they've been buried under the surface, which, of course, has massive problems. A, you have to dig it. The The actual surface itself is is hideously poisonous, full of perchlorates mm. and stuff like that. So it's a bit of a nightmare. But they've calculated that if you have five centimetres of ice, that's enough to protect you from the radiation because ice is brilliant at stopping radiation and... The glory is it allows natural light through. And, that is glory. Yeah, get this. Ice has better tensile properties than brick often. What? Yeah, wow. so it's a really brilliant building material for Mars. So there's going to be lots of natural light. And yeah. the, these robots will print the shell surface and – and that will be a Fresnel lens. Now, uh, a Fresnel lens is what you get in um, in light shows. It's or on the front of your car or in lighthouses. It makes the, the the light more diffuse and less kind of focused. So it's more of a kind of soft focus effect. Well, Matt, so, let mm -hmm. me tell you about the windows. Mm -hmm. Large. ETFE inflatable windows filled with radiation shielding. So so gas inside that would further expand the perceived volume and frame views uh, into the uh, into the landscape. That's genius, isn't it? Yeah, and ETFE, by the way, is the material that they use um, in the Eden Project. You know those big oh, really? domes. Yeah, yeah, that's that. That is what ETFE is, ah. and 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 that's kind of the clever thing. It's got this Dyneema reinforcement. So Dyneema is the strongest fabric uh, known to man. Fiber. What like stronger than a diamond? It uh, diamond isn't a fabric, is it? You wouldn't wear a oh. diamond coat unless you've gone mental. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm taking it back now. You've upset me. <laughs> um, and one of the things they've done is made it really tall. And one of the reasons why they've said they've made it tall is a transit habitat, i.e. the um, spaceship that takes you to Mars. You're going to be on for six six months. And NASA studies have shown that that's better as a kind of vertical stack so that people okay. are in various floors. So you're going from upstairs yeah. down into downstairs, mm -hmm. and that's what the trans transit habitat will be like. So they've made this the same so that you can orientate yourself to life on the red planet easier. Apologies to any bungalow fans out there. Stairs are so futuristic, man. The same with this one and the next one I want to talk about. They've both got this outer shell. So the outer shell... Uh, contains a kind of front yard area which will feel like an outside space that you don't need a spacesuit in. But it takes all the stress and strains, like the pressure that you have to hold inside. The outer shell is what holds that outer, uh, holds the kind of pressure, which means that you can do the inner building however you want to make it more uh, thinner walls and, and get more space out of it. So it's a really Genius. clever clever system and it involves things like the international space stations environmental control and life support systems that vent in to the interior volume but any kind of oxygen overflow can go into that outer shell and the hydroponics that surround the living quarters um can can start you know generating oxygen as well and keeping and everything much much nicer uh but the but the here's the here's the killer thing on on mars because of the weird pressure difference it's actually quite easy to print ice 
to actually spray it on because uh, okay. because because the because the way that pressure works, it's quite easy to collect the water as a gas. It it sort of goes into its gaseous phase quite easily, and then because the in the interior is under pressure, when you spray it, it instantly turns into water. And that water instantly turns into ice as it as it hits the structure as it as it gets ah, frozen down yes. under pressure. So it it actually you can start just sp- spraying this um, interior ice wall in internally next to the um, inflated dome that you've made the Eden Project style dome that you've made. You can you can spray this water up against that. And the the dome itself is taking the pressure, and the ice is protecting you from all the radiation. God damn, humans are clever, aren't they? An aerogel is also three D printed between the ice and the inner quarters, so that there's a bit of insulation stops the ice from melting and stops the inner quarters getting too uh, cold. And there's a couple of robots. There's one called Ibo, which is this triple nozzled printer which has got the fibre, water, and the aerogel, and, and, and it can climb up the wall as it prints the wall. So it kind of makes the ridges in the wall that, ah, turns, into yes. the, that turns into the Fresnel or Fresnel um, uh, walls of the, of the ice structure. Yes. And there's another, like ro- there's another robot called Wazibo, which... <laughs> which um, if you had a drink, Matt. Wazibo. And that is the water and sinter mining bot. So water, okay. sinter, wazibo. See what they've uh, done, yeah. And that one gets dropped on the floor and, and actually excavates the regolith and uh, and mines for water. It does both and builds the base that this, this ice house sits on. Here's a quick question for you. Mm-hmm. What... Are they planning to do with all of the junk that humans just inevitably make? And I don't just mean human waste. I mean like rubbish, uh, materials that have been excavated. What's going to happen? I, pre- I assume that they're not going to send it back to Earth. No, well, well, no, that's the thing. Virtually everything that gets made on Mars is going to be used in the actual buildings themselves or for other projects. And that really everything is about sustainability. So everything has to be recycled, like you said. I mean, it's not like they're going to go to the local Tesco and come back with a bunch of packaging that they need and to someone's going to go, put in the, oh, you bought to, plastic to bottles again. You know, and if you've been growing plants, you're not going to cut off the tops of uh, strawberries and, and put them in the in that kind of waste. So that everything would get recycled. You know, every single resource is so precious in that kind of environment that you wouldn't... Yeah, you, you, I don't think you would actually generate any rubbish you know even the human excrement and and urine will be recycled somehow back yes. into 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 the back system into the land yeah you know so so the, i just quickly maybe go they'll th- grow potatoes like matt damon matt damon so <laughs> the de- <laughs> let me just quickly go through the deployment so you can see how kind it. of quick this is so uh, it's going to take off. It's designed for a Falcon Heavy or SLS. It's that kind of yep. size payload. Uh, the ice house lands on the surface, but in the process of landing, the thrusters. So it lands a bit, a bit like a a, a, a SpaceX booster. Yeah, uh, and the thrusters as it lands excavate the surface, exposing the ice underneath, so they don't actually have to do any digging. So. Just by landing, they're doing some of the work. Now yeah. that's and and that's not just a sort of oh this might happen. That's exactly what happened when the Mars Phoenix lander landed in two thousand and eight. So they know that that works. Yes. Then Wasibo, the uh, little three uh, D print, the, the little sintering robot, uh-huh. that that is deployed instantly and starts mining the subsurface ice and yeah. starts to build the new foundation. It also uh, drops down a little reservoir and hose to fill up the, the reservoir from the little Wazibo robot. Uh-huh. Uh, and because of the clever way that Wazibo uses this phase change difference in, in on the Mars, the, the sort of lack of pressure on Mars and the physics, it's really, really simple and actually not that energy. Uh, it, it, it's much more efficient than it would be on Earth. So it's able to actually make this reservoir of, e- uh, of water quite, effectively and start building this um 
platform for the building to be built on. Yeah. Uh, uh, then once that start, once that's happened, once the habitation foundation has gone down, the uh, spacecraft that's landed inflates the um, membrane, uh, the ETFE membrane that's been precision made on Earth, and the yeah. air airlocks have already been integrated into that membrane. Yeah. Then the IBO starts to print the ice, and it adds this fibrous silica just to make it even stronger and last longer. Uh-huh. And and then the inner shells, which the living quarters are printed, and the aerogel is printed that insulates the ice from the interior. And then they start growing plants, and then the crew arrive and move in and bish bash Bob jobs jobs done. Bob's your uncle. Oh, love that. Phase two, Norman Foster and partners. They they um they they won phase two. Now uh-huh. fa- phase three was won by AI Space Factory. This building wow. called Marsha. I like that. Marsha. Marsha. And and this is another of these uh, 3D printed buildings. Like the Ice House, it's got an outer shell. And it's made from basalt, uh, which is oh. even stronger than Kevlar, and mixed with a, a kind of plastic, PLA, that they yeah. make from plants grown on Mars. Uh, and this one phase three so this was the one and it's a cylinder shape really really fantastic little cylinder shape and um and yeah and this 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 turned out to be the strongest design and so this was the the overall winner of the 3d printed habitat and you know what's really exciting jamie yeah they have made an earth version called terror in new yes in new york and i was going to say do you want to stop in terror when we do our road trip. Oh, hell yeah. We have to go to Terra. Yeah. So, Terra, so, New York. That sounds like my kind of place. Yeah. So if you f- see that link, Indiegogo, there's the Terra experience. And you can, I think, there's only a couple of days left to actually get on this. But the, yeah, it's only, it's like a hundred, um, it's like a hundred and forty, hundred and forty four pounds for one night in this 3D printed uh, cylinder that's like well, the ones they're going to build on Mars. Like it, it's it's basically absolutely genius. I think we have to do it. But listen, Matt. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to go. I love you, listeners. Um, Matt, do you have anything else to say? Uh, just a quick fact, Jamie. Go on. John Hayward's proverbs coined the famous phrase: "The moon is made of green cheese," but green means not aged. Ooh. doesn't mean green. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed Space Habitats. We hope you've enjoyed it. Follow us on Instagram because there's. I'm going to continue writing and talking about this stuff and there's much more information on the blog on the website. So, bye-bye, Spodcats. Goodbye, Spodcats. And we love you. Have a good weekend. Check us out on Instagram and go to www.interplanetary.org.uk for all the other info on how to become a Patreon year. Au revoir. Bye-bye, Spodcast. See you soon. Bye.